Richard, it was so nice just to catch up with little pre-chats just now. Uh, I, I, th- I think we have a lot of commonalities with various conductors and choirs, yeah. and so uh, just so lovely to meet you. Thank you for giving up a bit of your time. I must confess, we're pre-recording this on a, a rather bleak Sunday evening. Uh, I don't know if it's bleak where you are, but it certainly is with me. How are things? Yeah, fine. We're in York, and it's 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 beautiful, but it's bleak a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> that's just part of the regional character I think it's important isn't it look Richard thank you so much for for coming and talking I think recently uh, I've had a a couple of interviews with choral conductors choral directors I don't think yet I've had a a composer I believe you are the the 54th interviewee but the the first composer which is very exciting so thank you for taking You're, you're too kind. Thank you for taking to the to the hot seat. I, I wonder whether you could just tell us a little bit about your about your background, your compositional process, and 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 where, whereabouts you are in life generally. Oh, that's lots of questions. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm in my sort of mid to late fifties, and I'm still in love with music. I'm still in love with what I, I would say my subject really, and I've always felt that way. But like any love affair, it doesn't always it's, it isn't always a smooth run of things. It's not a kind of romantic love, if you like. Um, but I've I just remember being a kid and making just sounds on a piano as, as a kid and whatever. There was music at home. My father was I've said this many times. But my my father was I think quite a gifted I think um, amateur musician and ran a choir and I sang as a kid and and that kind of thing. Um, I never I never really sort of fitted in anywhere quite. You know, I played violin and adored it. I adored because I just love the repertoire, but I was a bit rubbish, um, you know. And and you know, and I, you know, I'm a, I've always said I'm a piano player, not a pianist. Um, but I love the access that playing has given me to various things. Um, and you know, yeah, it's just a beautiful world to, to be a part of. Um, and so, yeah, I find myself writing. Writing, I think, is where I'm most comfortable taking time to say things. And. I write all sorts of styles. Um, there's quite a lot of choral music that's published, but I love working in all genres, really. So I will, you know, I'm I'm, I'm chipping away at a little pop album I recorded some years ago with a friend. Um, I'm, I'm loving that, um, and I write. I've written things for kids, um, which are much more sort of light-hearted. I've written concert pieces, um, you know, liturgical pieces. Again, you know, secular, sacred. Um, I, 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 yeah, just chamber music, musical theatre. I kind of love it all, really. Um, and it's just that, as I say, like a love affair, sometimes it goes well and sometimes um, it, it doesn't, but you work hard and you turn up. And, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. It does it, entirely. I, I wonder, do you, are you somebody that works quite well with having a, a sort of deadline? Uh, you know, you've got to get a piece written for, for something or, or, or do you enjoy the sort of process and having a bit more freedom? It, it's both. And you, you, you really need to ask the people I write for whether I'm any good with <laughs> deadlines. I think there's something brilliant about a deadline. I think um, there's a lovely quote by the amazing Prince where he talks about artists and, or musicians and the artists, and he says, artists think with their heart. And I think that's very true. I think the things that we hold close and that why do we keep doing what we do? I think it is a matter of the heart, but a deadline isn't a deadline. It's a very kind of immediate cerebral kind of, you've just got to get things. And we, we need both really. And sometimes, I think I've written well to a deadline and I've loved that. And other times I've found it quite quite a burden. Um, and then other times, you know, writing for pleasure is an odd thing to say because you can write for a commission. I, I, earlier in the year, I had a, a lovely, a really lovely commission from the pianist Libby Burgess uh, for the singer Aoife Miss Kelly. Um, now Libby, you may know, um, an amazing sort of pianist and, and chamber musician. Um, co-runs the Beverly Chamber Music Festival with Martin Roscoe. And they have a sponsor, Neil Edwards, who um, writes poems, uh, by which I mean he writes two or three every day. Um, and the idea was that I would set some of the poems as a, a gift for his wife's birthday. And it was just brilliant. And it was lovely for me not you know, I mean, I love writing choral music um, uh, and all that kind of stuff, but it was so nice to sort of put something else front and centre. 
And so it was lovely, you know, choosing and editing the poems, uh, working with an amazing musical team, and actually in a very low key way. So the first performance was, um, you know, at their house with, you know, invited friends. Um, and I, I loved it. And the music came very quickly. I had, I had COVID and could do nothing. Uh, of any use at all, uh, but I, you know you can still sit and dream, really. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I can't even remember what the question was, but you know, it, it leads you down different paths, and I think that's constantly sort of re rewarding. But that, whether it's commission or not, and they were lovely about the deadline, and it was very flexible about you know, and it, it worked really well. But you know, yeah, writing for pleasure, writing for deadlines, you know, it, it's a very it, sometimes it's hard to find a path. But ultimately rewarding, I think. I, I wonder, do, do you have forces that uh, you find especially appealing writing for? Is there a sort of, you know, a, a favoured uh, choral size of group or, or, or perhaps it, it might be sort of a particular orchestra or something? Is there something where you feel most um, that your work sort of speaks most clearly? Oh, um, that was a terribly phrased question. I, I must no, apologise. No, I think it was good, but... and it was quite probing. <laughs> I, when you write for people, the thing I try to get right again, they may they may disagree. The thing you try to get right is that it's a good fit, even if it's sometimes that's ambitious for a group or something. If the if the kind of the landscape of the piece somehow addresses what you've been discussing and the creative process has paid off that's that's the thing that's very really very re rewarding however then by that you're usually dictated to you the forces that you write for are, are kind of given even if you can prod or twiddle them a little bit um and for me one of the things that i think i i love is polychoral pieces very few of which are recorded or recorded commercially um, and I, I had the great fortune many years ago I was um, composer in association with the National Youth Choirs and there was a, a brilliant anniversary and I wrote a piece called Christ's Love Song for the main choir and the amazing training choir and the children's choir um, and that is one of many pieces um, I wrote a piece in the in the 90s uh, UBS which again was done through the auspices of the National Youth Choir, but again, that's for three choirs. And these pieces get done very, <laughs> for obvious reasons, uh, very, very rarely. But going back to that point that, you know, you kind of think with your heart, um, those pieces are very, you know, quite dear to me for different reasons. And I love that expanse. And it's that sort of, not quite a sort of Phil Spector wall of sound, but, you know, you know Gabriella did it or Palestrina did it, you know. Yes, yes, um, as a president. You know, and there's something just <laughs> magic about groups in an in, in antiphony. And that excites me. Um, but I think where it comes from, I, I think pop music for me, the, the cleverness of pop, the way that... I'm going to make it sound really dull, really, or, or, or simplistic. But you, you know, the way that reverb or delay are used. You know, I'm I, I'm I teach uh, A level, and one of the one of the topics is pop music from 1960 to 2000, and we look at things like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, um, which is just so awful, whether you like the music or not. The way the sound picture is put together um, is just so exciting and sort of uh, you know sort of stimulating. And I, I, the control that you have in a studio, I think, is lovely. But actually, you get a taste of that. I think polychoral works with two, three, four or more choirs um, is a way that is it's a kind of old school analog equivalent, really. Mm. But I like, but I like everything. You know, I like writing for, you know, for solo instruments or, or chamber groups, or as I say, you know, you know small scale musical theatre things. Uh, so listening to to some of your uh, your works, it, it dissonance itself. It is quite a quite a heavy feature in in your work, and I, I just wondered how um, to to achieve that sort of really carefully tuned dissonance over lots of chords. I'm Obviously, no, okay. no, please do pour away. Carry on. Um, <laughs> It should be in shot. I mean, we want to see the tea bag, the full experience. No, 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 um, just, no, no it's, it's good. Carry on. <laughs> um, um, I was, what was I saying? I can't remember. Something about dissonance. dissonance. Oh yes. Look, your work is, is is has a dissonance to it, mm. and I just wondered whether that means that it it's more suitable for professional singers, not necessarily um, 
and just because they're paid but because i don't know because it's more of a challenge i don't know how you feel about that about me saying that no absolutely you, you you're totally right um and i have sort of several things again i pick, pick this over myself really it's a bit like when you have kids really they sort of come out the way they come out and i think pieces are a bit like that Some of the pieces are right, and you know, I, you know, you can feel on some sort of rolling their eyes, going, "Here we go again." Um, yeah, they're, they're tough. They're tough on the, the singers. I had the great privilege as um, as a student, really, in my my twenties. Um, I got to present flowers uh, on stage at Covent Garden, so I used to stand on stage every single night and listen to just extraordinary voices. And I know that that's got into my way of thinking. Those, you, you know, heroic, you know, you know, tenors or something, or whoever, whichever voice part, but who can, you know, got Teflon vocal cords and they can just mm. sing all the way up and all the way down hour after hour, you know. And I know that there's a de demand there, but when it works, um, I, I work with a, uh, the wonderful aura chamber choir, and, mm. you know, Susie Digby, and they commissioned yeah. a piece based on talents called Vida to Miraculum, which is a, it is a real slog vocally, but when it, when it works, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I stand by that sound world really, but it is, it is demanding. And I'm, I'm totally with you on that. I think, I don't think that's the extent of my work. And there's a lot of, you know, even sort of kitsch songs uh, for kind of kids that are kind of poppy and upbeat and a little bit sort of cheeky. Um, and there's also stuff that's really very straightforward. Um, but I agree that sound well thing. It, 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 yes, I think when I was studying music as a, an undergraduate, it was in the 80s, and anybody that did a university degree in the 80s will tell you that it, it, you really studied modernism. And it was very hard to filter what was good and bad. I was hugely stimulated and I loved it. And there are certain pieces that I think are just world changing and extraordinary. You know, Maxwell Davis eight songs from Mad King. You know, the world is a better place for that. It's not an easy listen, um, but I, one of the things I think being a composer is that you have to find your own voice. And as composition students, we were forever being given tasks to write like other people. And that teaches you something, but it doesn't make you who you are. And I think uh, I kind of was at odds with that. And I was right. I went to university really loving writing music and wanting to write. And I came out of it not wanting to. And it was only the presence of Arvo Paird on ECM with that um, that kind of gave me a little bit of encouragement that actually just to carry on. And he had himself had rejected a kind of, you know, a, a much more kind of, you know, dissonant and kind of crazy musical, you know, idiom to, to develop that sort of Tintinabuli style that is so kind of lean and so beautiful, works so, so well um, with voices particularly. And I think that gave me and others, I think, license to, Kind of stick to our guns really i have written some pretty chromatic and pretty out there things but that dissonance it's still tonal music for, for you know it's you know and again i've said many times if you chop me in half i'm i'm probably a kind of you know you know lounge cocktail player you know i love the great american songbook and that yeah that kind of music of the 40s, 50s, 60s, particularly, uh, uh, you know, I don't write jazzy pieces. They're not, you know, once, you know, but I think it's a shared language. And the other thing for me, not so much to do with the dissonance, but plain song is a big influence for me, both, I think, from kind of childhood, early years and rediscovering it as a, as a, as a music student. And that modality that is shared with um, kind of choral music board and, and through jazz and, and and pop, of course. Interestingly, teaching A-level students pop, they all know the grade five theory. And of course, that's really not much use to you at all. There are so many different systems. So again, long answer to a short question, but yeah, I think it's I think it's fair that music is, is often quite demanding. Um, there are so many avenues uh, to take from from your from your answer, but perhaps just returning briefly to the the idea of the studio. You mentioned you like the idea of the the sort of ability to turn up the reverb a, a little bit, and yeah. I just wondered when you're if you get to the stage where you're listening back to a choir that's performed your work, uh, or you're you're analysing a recording or something. Are there ever moments where you 
where you where you want to change something out of frustration or where where you want to sort of uh, tell the performers how to express something slightly differently do, do you ever feel like you've lost control over work do you know what i'm getting at <clears throat> yes again lots of questions there really and there are, there are times in performances where you wish you could be a bit more hands on and just say you know adjust a tempo or a balance or a vo for a voicing thing and there are bits of pieces where I look back and go, ah, I just wish I'd done something slightly different. The thing that, again, I think, you know, software has helped, I think, young, younger composers, but your job really is not, you know, if you're in a band and you write a song, you just go, here I go, it's, it's G7 followed by C7 or whatever. Um, and the, but you're not in the room really when this happens. So you, your, your, your kind of writing chops need to be good. And you try to get everything neat and so it's going to work and it should fall off the page. Um, sometimes, you know, things just, just get lost in translation. Sometimes I, I may not have been clear enough, but generally speaking, the recorded work that's out there, um, you know, is of a very high standard. But yeah, we, you know, I do agonise over these things. Yeah, it's, mm. yeah, when when a recording goes especially well, and I mean the question that you get asked, uh, you know, around a premiere or something, and and someone will very kindly say, you know, did you mean it to sound like that? Which I assume they mean in a kindly way. And you go, well, yeah, that's the gig. You know, that's what you that's what you try to do. But in a in the hands of really good musicians, there's more that comes. There's a, you know when people can really understand and 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 that's a, that's again that's a, that's a real kind of thrill. Yeah, I I'd hate to compare uh, your work to other composers because I, I, it doesn't seem the right thing to do. But it's just I do find it interesting how you hear the sort of kind of elements of a modern American style, but then you never seem to lose touch with a sort of English choral sound, Finzi-esque, and sort of elements of, of lots of different things. And it's very interesting how you can walk both roads and never sort of, you know, become the, the servant to either. I, I don't know. Um, you must... Oh, thank you. Do you ever feel pressure to write in a certain way? Or you talked earlier about uh, how as composers we have to find our own voice, but did you ever feel sort of pigeonholed in a certain direction? I think it took me a very long time to find my voice. And I think, as I said earlier, I, I, I came out of university very disengaged. I felt that I, I couldn't do what was required. And I just sort of locked myself away, really. And then um, I trained to be a teacher in my mid twenties. And in fact, that gave me a kind of confidence to I didn't just pick up, pick up the pen really again. And I wrote a piece for uh, the lovely uh, Trinity College of Music, did external diplomas for, for, for um, composition that you could do without having to be there. And I was already deep in teaching. And I wrote um, a piece called Salva Regina in 92. And I in, uh, entered that and then I sort of wrote some letters to some very important people and some of them wrote back. The lovely John Scott, if you remember that name, um, <laughs> very kind, he, he, they never did it, but, but um, he was very kind and what an amazing musician. Anyway, it sat on a draw for three years. And I, again, as I mentioned, National Youth Choir took it on um, and BBC Symphony Chorus did it. And then NYC did it at the proms many years ago. And for me, that's a sort of, but by which time I'm quite old, you know what I mean? And so it took me a while. And then I kind of felt with through the National Youth Choir, I was giving myself a sort of apprenticeship. So I only write a handful of pieces a year. It's only by virtue of the fact that I'm quite old now that there are, there's you know, a reasonable body of work out there. But yeah. So just, just learning and things slowly and, and, and listening and trying not to write the same piece twice you know one of the things I, I i tell people if i mentor them you know you know choirs have got photocopies they can just copy them you know don't, don't copy other people's music for them you know just try and find what you do um 
the other thing is, and I, I sit on a, a fence, as I say, some of the repertoire is very easy and very singable, and some of it isn't. But I think it's back to this reason of why do we write? And I, I hope there's a sense of in, integrity in the work. As I say, pieces come, have a habit of coming out how they come out. Um, and every piece is, is, is interesting to do. Um, and without trying to sound like someone from sort of Love Island or something, sometimes, you know, it is what it is, you know, or, or you know, it, it, you know you, you, it's the kind of, the, the kind of cross I bear. Um, I have limited kind of commercial success, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Do I still love the product? Yeah, I, I, I kind of do. Um, but I hope I've not, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, really. I, on one of the interviews you did uh, with the Aura singers, uh, you, you were talking about the idea of inspiration coming from unusual places. And I, I, I loved this uh, story you told about sort of driving past, I think it was John Lewis or something. And, 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 true, yeah. and something came, was it the Coventry Carol? I, I can't remember, but um, um, maybe it, it was, was something uh, else. It was in the bleak which I'm just simply it, driving around a small roundabout in town. <laughs> Um, it, you know, John Lewis, a lovely brand. Other brands are available. Of course, you know, yes, wasn't yes, the inspiration yeah, yeah. that just happened to be where I, I, I was. And sometimes you slog forever, and sometimes things just sort of come. Really, yeah. But carry on. So you were saying? No, I, no. Um, um, I, I, I can't remember what I was going to say, but I just found that very interesting. And and I think sometimes um, composers must be trying to create uh, the sort of next uh, Matthew Passion or something, you know, in in their work. But actually, there's a a sort of beauty in 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 the simplicity and and one of your other pieces this the the Coventry Carol I, I only heard it about half an hour ago to be honest as I was I was prepping for the interview but <laughs> immensely clever how it, it's it, it's simple in its nature but has this just sort of gentle winding chromatic line around it and it, it's just enough um for it to sort of stand alone and 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 Yes, a, a highly recommended piece. Other pieces are available. Um, and I, well, again, uh, the, the Coventry Carol, I've again said this elsewhere, but um, that began life as an instrumental piece. So it was written in the 90s for the Bingham String Quartet for a, um, a South Bank. We were doing a charity concert. And would I write a sort of Peter and the Wolf kind of accompanying piece? Excuse me. And anyway, we ended up with Christmas Carol. I write with my brother a lot, who's a, is a, an editor and works in publishing, and he did a, a beautiful abridgment. And there's the bit where Scrooge is revisiting his former self. It's in stave two. And I wanted just to evoke a sense of oldie wildiness, I suppose. And there's something so bittersweet about the Coventry Carol. And so there's just a few bars of it in, 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 in that. And then I was asked to just, did I have any carols or would I do some arrangements? I can't quite remember. But that's how the full version, if you like, came came out. But it's that sort of rocking lullaby. And the you know, the lyrics and the whole nature of the, you know, the slaughter of the innocents is, is, is just horrific, whether you're a believer or you're not. Um, and so, you know, all young children to slay. Um, I don't really get on with the kind of mall music, the very simple sort of slightly rinky-tinky versions that sometimes get pumped out, really. I think there's a, a, a drama in the lyric and the story that was crying out, really, for something else. And, you know, and it's an odd piece, really, because uh, occasionally I write pieces that don't finish in the keys they start in. And that finishes down as a subdued, and it finishes as a tone down from the original. You hear the, you hear the burden um, at the end, but it's, it's down a tone and whether you again if you're aware of it or not there's a sense to which there's things are subdued um but it's not that as i say that kind of mall music version of of, of christmas carols so i don't know how we got there but yeah uh, me, me neither i was talking with a uh with a composer friend about uh you know, going and playing for a concert, a Christmas concert, and it, I, you know, I assumed, oh, shall I turn up with a hundred carols for choirs? Is this, is this what's needed? And he said, "Don't you dare! There will be no a hundred carols for choirs here." And I'm just, uh, you know, as an aside, interested to know your uh, sort of opinion on the, you know, the hold that Wilcox and 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 the sort of that school uh, has over 
Christmas as a, you know, entity? <laughs> oh, yeah. Good question. I was massively inspired as a youngster by those carrots for choirs, as, as many of us are, I think. I still use them now. The lovely John Rutter, who I, th you know, I think is sometimes sort of maligned, really, in the way that people who have achieved a, a, really quite a, 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 an amount of success just are, because they've become targets. Everything is so beautifully written. Everything is so, works so well. And the dis discipline, I think, of those, particularly the first two books, Perhaps I'm saying that because I'm more familiar with them than others. Again, I used the phrase earlier, you, you know, the music just sort of falls off the page. And there are things that are very, very simple and things that aren't. You know, Joubert's Tortures, I've just done uh, with a choir, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And you learn it very, 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 very quickly. It's massively rewarding. And then, uh, you know, you've got extracts from, you know, as a boy was born by Britain and things. I mean, it's just... It, it's phenomenal, really, that the stuff is there. I, I think um, deserves all the success it had. Is there room for other stuff? Yeah, totally. And I love that, you know, those crazy pieces like the Sandstrom, this is Steinrose and, and Sprung, and, you know, that's not going to fit into council choirs, but it's just beautiful the way that it reinvents things. Um, yeah, we, 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 you know, and you have to look outside to, to find interesting things. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think it's an amazing institution, but there's there's more. Yeah, I wonder in imparting thoughts uh, about your your. I feel horrible to ask this, but your your desert island. Um, I don't know compositional genre or or composer. Uh, perhaps that the 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 person or or group who sort of influenced you more than anything else, and who you would be happy to listen to. On your desert island, I don't know how we've become desert island discs. It's a Sunday night. No, it's, it's a great, it's a great January. Thing. It's bleak. I mean, goodness me. <laughs> I am. I, um, I have a five-year-old daughter, and I love the. You know, if you ask her what her favourite is, you know, she will say, "Well, I don't really have favourites. You know, I don't have favourites because she loves everything." I'm, I'm afraid I'm still rather childish and rather like that. What would I take with me? Figaro, really, I think. You know, I love Glenn Gould playing all sorts of things. Um, but I, I don't really, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big jazz fan. And I, I love the great sort of singers, you know, 50s Sinatra or pretty much anything by Ella Fitzgerald, whether it's, you know, rocking out with Duke, Duke Ellington or something on the Côte d'Azur or those lovely intimate things she did with Joe Pass. I, I really, honestly, I don't really know what I would take. Would I take choral music? I have no idea, really. I just, I know, I, I don't, I would, you know, Beethoven, late quartets. I, all of the quartets, to be honest. <laughs> Haydn, Opus 20, you know. I, mean, I, I No, I couldn't really. Um, yeah, I find that tough. <laughs> I suspected that that would be the answer, but uh, some some great insight into into many genres. I think you you will end up with a with with one of those iPods, you know, from the nineteen nineties or yeah. when they were around. Wonderful those old iPods without all the all the uh, inconvenience of modern smartphone technology. Before totally, the days you, you just it, 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 nothing you just put on music and listen to it, and there's nothing else there. Yes. I spend my life scrolling, you know. Yeah. Richard. Elaine, thank you so much for for giving up some of your some of your Sunday nights. It's much appreciated. And not at all. It's lovely to to, to chat. I, I, I hope I've made some sense. But thank you so much. All the best for twenty twenty three. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. Happy New Year to you.